God says he can tell things at the very end from all the way back in the very beginning, the things that are not yet done. People are living in fear, even without the terrorists to try and strike more fear into people's hearts. The Bible says that in the last days that men's hearts will be failing them for fear of the things that are soon to come upon the world. So many people today are really concerned that we're headed towards some sort of a nuclear holocaust, that one power or another is going to push a button and destroy the whole world. Then there are others that are talking about an antichrist. They're talking about one world governments, the new world order, all of these type of things. So we're going to take a look at some good news tonight, and that is the coming one world government. Many people don't think of that as good news, but we'll see tonight when we're finished why it is not just good news, it's great news. So when we want to know where to go for answers to the questions that so many people have, they try all kinds of different ways to find out things about the future. The, the psychics not only just sit in little storefront buildings anymore, they're on television or you can call them on the telephone, you can pay them about $10 a minute to talk to them. But can they find answers? You know, the Bible tells us something that is very, very significant that we're going to look at tonight. But people try through all sorts of means, including different religions. But do you know that the Quran is used by a lot of people in the world? But you know the writings of Muhammad contain absolutely no prophecies whatsoever. The same is true of Buddhism. Buddhism is very prevalent throughout the Eastern world, but yet the writings of Buddha do not contain any prophecy. The known Chinese philosopher Confucius wrote a lot of wise things, but he wrote nothing about prophecy. None of these people say anything about prophecy, but yet 30% of the Bible is prophecy. That's a lot of prophecy when you consider that 30% of what's in here is prophetic. So as we look at the Bible, we see something very, very important that we understand about God. In the book of Isaiah, the 46th chapter in verses 9 and 10, our God says, For I am God and there is no other. I am God and there is none like me. Now notice what sets him apart here declaring the end from the beginning and from ancient times, the things that are not yet done. God says he can tell things at the very end from all the way back in the very beginning, the things that are not yet done, because God knows everything and he reveals much of this to us in the scripture. Remember, there is never going to be a time when something happens in this world and God says, oops, I did not see that one coming. He knows all of these things. He is God. And so tonight we're going to look at one of the prophetic books of the Bible, and that is the book of Daniel. The book of Daniel uh, meets with a lot of skepticism today. A lot of people say, oh, you can't believe the book of Daniel. And it depends on which of these so-called scholars you want to go to. Some of them say you shouldn't believe the book of James. Some say you shouldn't believe the book of Revelation. Some say you shouldn't believe anything that was written before the book of Acts chapter 2. Uh, that would be terrible because all the gospel of Jesus and his life on earth is in there before that. So we have all of these people, but the authenticity of the book of Daniel is attested to by other people in the Bible, including Ezekiel, who was a contemporary uh, of Daniel. And notice what Ezekiel said about Daniel. He said, though these three men, Noah, Daniel, and Job, were in it, or that is in the land, they should deliver but their own souls by their righteousness, saith the Lord God. So here the prophet Ezekiel 
identifies Daniel as one of God's prophets, puts him in the same class there with Noah and Job, who, by the way, are also ridiculed by many people in the world who say, oh, there was never a flood, and Job is a fairy tale, and you wouldn't believe what people say about the Bible. Notice what Ezekiel goes on and says. Though Noah, Daniel, and Job were in it, as I live, saith the Lord God, they shall deliver neither son nor daughter, they shall deliver but, their, but deliver their own souls by their righteousness. Now something very important to notice in that picture that is portrayed there, it says, saith who? The Lord God. So it's not just Ezekiel attesting to Daniel, but it is the Lord God himself. Even Jesus in the New Testament referred to Daniel. Watch this. Jesus personally referred to Daniel as a true prophet. Here's what he said in Matthew. And this gospel of the kingdom shall be preached in all the world for a witness unto all nations, and then shall the end come. When ye therefore shall see the abomination of desolation spoken of by who? Daniel the prophet, stand in the holy place. Whoso readeth, let him understand. We'll be looking at the significance of what Jesus is talking about here, about the abomination of desolation in a later meeting. But Jesus said Daniel was one of his prophets. So we have the attestation of prophets of God and of Jesus Christ. And this book of Daniel that we're going to look at tonight pertains particularly to the time of the end in which we are now living. We are living down at the very close of this earth's history, and this book is particularly there for us. It is written for those of us living today. And um, it was written about 600 years before the time of Jesus. And that's one of the reasons the critics reject the book of Daniel. They said nobody could have known those things that were in Daniel unless it was written about 300 years later. But they take out of the equation that God is God and he knows all things, declaring the end from the beginning. So as we look back in the scripture, we see that Daniel can be divided into two parts. There are the stories and the prophecies. The stories in the Bible tell us how to prepare for what is going to take place in the fulfillment of those prophecies. So the prophecies tell us how close we are to an event, and the stories tell us how to make preparation to go through that event and stand faithful to God. So as we look at the scriptures here, the prophecies tell us how close we are to the end, and the stories tell us how to prepare for the end. So Daniel presents here a tremendous or gigantic struggle between two powers, the powers of heaven and the powers of hell. It is a great cosmic conflict, if you will, between Christ and Satan. Babylon was the center of idolatry and false worship. I would submit to you tonight, though, that Babylon was no more idolatrous than this country today or the whole world. Uh, I, I just wish I had time to tell you some things I've seen as I've traveled around this country and abroad of how the idolatry has come into this world. These people in Babylon were in rebellion against God, and it was at the very center of their existence. They did not want to worship God. This is a problem we have today, only we word it a little differently. You worship God your way, I'll worship God my way. There's a real problem with that, friends, because you can worship God your way, and I can worship God my way, but unless one of those two ways is God's way, then we're in trouble. We must worship him in spirit and in truth according to God's way. So as we look back at Babylon again, to give you the background, it was the citadel or the stronghold of apostasy and error. They were going to try and destroy the people of God. It was the stronghold of licentiousness and immorality and pleasure seeking. If it feels good, do it. If it tastes good, eat it. You know, 
it was all too self-pleasing. Now, Jerusalem, on the other hand, the city of God's people, was the center of the worship of the true God. It was the custodian of the truths of God's word. And it was to stand loyally to the principles of heaven. There's the contrast now between these two powers. They were to exhibit self-control, temperance, and purity. You see the difference? Two totally different uh, entities there. But one day God allowed his people to be taken into captivity. He allowed Jerusalem to be overthrown because of a couple of very important things. First of all, they now rebelled against God as the Babylonians were in rebellion. Also, these people followed the abominations of the people about them. We want to be like the other people. We want to be like the other churches. We want to be a part of what's going on. And so as a result, God let them go into captivity with the rebels of Babylon and follow the abominations of those who did not follow God. And the third reason was because the people of Israel rejected the warnings God sent through the prophets. God sent the prophets to warn them, and they wouldn't listen. Jesus said he sent the prophets and you killed them. And he gave a parable. He said, eventually, this man had this, this vineyard, and he sent his servants to talk to the people who managed it for him. And they kept killing the servants, the prophets. He said, so finally, the man says, I'll send my own son. Surely they'll receive him. He's given the story of what was going to happen to him. And when he got there, the people said, let's kill him too, and then we'll own everything. This was the mentality of the people. So God allowed the captivity of Israel there to accomplish two things. First, to lead the people to repentance, to confession of sin, and to dependence upon God. You know, so many people don't want anything to do with God until they've got no place else to go. And I find this so frequently that, no, I don't have time for God right now. And then the second reason was to carry a knowledge of the true God to Babylon. Remember, God put Israel in an, a tremendous place, crossroads of the world over there. But these self-righteous folk began to wrap their pharisaical robes around them and said, we are the people of God, and if anything want, anybody wants anything from us, they have to come to us. And so they would not take the good news of God's word to the countries about them. So as we look at Daniel here, we're going to see that Daniel is going to cover about 2,600 years of history. Do you remember the days when people were afraid that Russia was going to one day rule the world? Most of us were raised in that Cold War after World War II, you see. And Russia was going to control the whole world. And there's no doubt that the Soviet Union was definitely one of the most powerful nations in the world. But where is the Soviet Union today? It's non-existent. It's non-existent. The Soviet Union did not succeed in its desire to rule the world because it was on a collision course with a power that it had refused to reckon with. Remember, the Soviet Union outlawed Christianity. They would not accept the power of God. And so as a result, they eliminated a host of other world powers and sought to control the whole world and destroy God's people as well. Now, another question. Have you ever wondered why Europeans cannot seem to get together? Any of you ever traveled to Europe? It's an interesting experience. I lived over there for five years. And uh, that was when the American dollar was worth something. When I lived there, there were four marks to a dollar. Today there's 1.83 or something like it. Less than half of what it used to be. Much of Europe has gone on the euro. People were terrified. All that euro 
of the European common market and all of that is going to unite all of the nations of Europe. Don't, don't believe that. We'll see this tonight, that it, in the vernacular of uh, my childhood, it ain't going to happen. It's just not going to take place. But the Europeans, they can't seem to get together. They're always arguing with one another. So why is it that the English, the Germans, the French, the Italians, the Swiss, and all of those can't seem to live in unity and harmony? Why is there not a United States of Europe? You see, here in this country, Americans are made up of all these people plus people from everywhere else in the world. And generally speaking, we seem to get along without too much effort. But you see, the, the same thing is, is true in India. They all seem to get, and that's a big country, by the way, and a lot of people. But why not Europe? You see, many have tried to will the, the, the well the European nations together into one great power. If you remember your history in school, remember Charlemagne. He was going to put together this world empire over there. He was followed by Charles V. And Charles V, you know, and his Holy Roman Empire. You know that Holy Roman Empire that you read about is like a guinea pig? You see, a guinea pig is not a guinea, and it's not a pig. And the Holy Roman Empire was not holy, and it wasn't Roman. So after Charles V, we have Louis XIV. He and Marie Antoinette were going to build this whole world empire. Napoleon was going to do that. Kaiser Wilhelm, even Stalin and all of those guys, Marx and all the rest of them were going to do it. And when Wilhelm couldn't succeed, along came Adolf Hitler. Same plan, and it looked for a while like he was going to succeed, but he too failed. Why have all of these people failed? You know, we have states in this country. As a matter of fact, this state right here is bigger than much of Europe by itself. You could put Luxembourg and Liechtenstein and Germany and France and Belgium and Amsterdam and probably a couple of others in the state of Texas, and we'd still have room to shake them up a little bit. But these little countries can't seem to get it together. The Word of God holds the answer for this. We're going to look at an ancient dream tonight. Nebuchadnezzar had a dream way back in about 538. In his dream there, he sees something that was so startling that it woke him up. You ever woke up in the middle of the night and you had this dream and Sometimes you wake up just shaking, other times sweating. I had a dream once when my wife and I were first married. I didn't know about it till she woke me up and told me. I was laughing. She said, she woke me up and said, Joe, what are you laughing at? And I said, Jerry Lewis. <laughs> Don't remember a thing of it. But sometimes we do remember these dreams. And this king had a problem, though. He could not remember his dream. So take your Bibles tonight and let's go to the book of Daniel. We're going to quickly go through this this evening. Daniel chapter 2. In the first verse there, it says, In the second year of the reign of Nebuchadnezzar, Nebuchadnezzar dreamed dreams wherewith his spirit was troubled and his sleep break from him. Then the king commanded to call the magicians, the astrologers, the sorcerers, the Chaldeans, for to show the king his dream. So they came and stood before the king. And the king said unto them, I have dreamed a dream, and my spirit was troubled to know the dream. Then spake the Chaldeans to the king in Syriac, O king, live forever. Tell thy servants the dream. And we will show you the interpretation. Watch this. Daniel answered in the presence of the king and said, The secret which the king has commanded or demanded cannot the wise men, the astrologers, the magicians, the soothsayers, show unto the king. But there is a God in heaven, watch this, that reveals secrets and makes known to the king Nebuchadnezzar what shall be when. 
in the latter days. Thy dream and the vision of thy head upon thy bed are these. You see, Daniel says, I can't do it. No wise man can do this. But there is a God in heaven that will reveal these secrets. And it's important that we understand that. This prophecy is for the time of the end. Keep your finger there in Daniel 2. And let's go back for a moment to Daniel 12. I want to show you what I said in the beginning, that the book of Daniel was written for those of us living today. Daniel chapter 12, last chapter in the book of Daniel. Look at verse 4. Gabriel tells Daniel, O Daniel, shut up the words and seal the book. Even to the time of the end, many shall run to and fro, and knowledge shall be increased. You see, the book of Daniel was shut up and closed until when? The time of the end. Look down in verse 8. And I heard, but I understood not. Then said I, O oh my Lord, what shall be the end of these things? And verse 9 says, and he said, Go your way, Daniel, for the words are closed up and sealed till the what? The time of the end. Verse 10. Many shall be purified and made white and tried, but the wicked shall do wickedly, and none of the wicked shall understand, but the wise shall understand. And then the 13th verse at the bottom. But go your way till the end be, for that thou shalt rest and stand in thy lot at the end of the days. Daniel was written for the last days in which we are now living. Okay? It was written to give us some prophetic insights to what is going to take place. Not only in our time now, but what did take place foretold thousands of years in advance. So four reasons for prophecy. One, prophecy produces evidence of the existence of God. Only God can tell the end from the beginning. Prophecy also reveals an omnipotent God, an all-powerful God who sets up and takes down kingdoms. And then the third reason, it strengthens our confidence in God and his word. Because when we see how prophecy has been fulfilled in the past, we can have absolute confidence that what's still to happen will happen exactly the way God said it would happen. And then the fourth purpose for prophecy is to prepare us for what is about to happen in this world. Very important purposes there. But in addition to that, there are also three principles of prophetic interpretation. When we look at prophecy, we must apply these three principles. Otherwise, we'll get confused like so many of the rest of the world who do not understand these things. First of all, we must read the prophecy through very carefully, noting each detail. Second, we must discover the biblical interpretation of the prophecy. Remember, Peter says, no prophecy of Scripture is of any private interpretation. In other words, we're not free to put our interpretation on what the Word of God says. The Bible will interpret itself. When we see these beasts and winds and seals and and all of these dragons and things like that. The Bible tells us what all of those are. We must let the Bible give us the interpretation of these things. And number three, we then must search for historical fulfillment. If it hasn't been fulfilled, if we can't find a historical fulfillment, um, then we know that it's a future prophecy. Okay? So going back to Daniel here, Let's take a look at this, this prophecy. He says there, But there is a God in heaven that reveals secrets and makes known to Nebuchadnezzar what shall be in the latter days. This is verse 28. Thy dream and the vision of thy head upon thy bed are these. As for thee, O king, thy thoughts came into thy mind upon thy bed. What should come to pass when? It wasn't written for Nebuchadnezzar's day. It was written for things that were going to happen in the future. Okay? And he that reveals secrets makes known to thee what shall come to pass. 
But as for me, this secret is not revealed to me for any wisdom that I have more than any living, but for their sakes that shall make known the interpretation to the king and that you might know the thoughts of your heart. Daniel says, this isn't revealed to me because I'm any better than anybody else. God's going to reveal to you what's going to happen in the future. Thou, O king, sawest, and behold, a great image. This great image, whose brightness was excellent, stood before thee, and the form thereof was terrible. The image's head was of fine gold, his breast and his arms of silver, belly and thighs of brass, his legs of iron, his feet part of iron and part of clay. And thou sawest till a stone was cut out without hands, which smote the image upon his feet that were of iron and clay, and break them to pieces. You see, he reached right into the furthest recesses of Nebuchadnezzar's mind and pulled out that thing that Nebuchadnezzar had seen. I can just imagine in my own mind Nebuchadnezzar starting to come up on that throne saying, yeah, that's it, Daniel. That's what it was that I saw. This image, it had a golden head. It had arms and chest of silver, a belly and thighs of brass, legs of iron and feet of iron and clay. That's exactly what I saw, Daniel. But Daniel isn't through yet. He says, you saw this great image standing there with those four medals, and all of a sudden, something happens to it. But before he explains that, he goes on and he tells Nebuchadnezzar something very important. Thou, O king, art a king of kings, for the God of heaven has given you kingdom and power and strength and glory. And wheresoever the children of men dwell, the beasts of the field and the fowls of heaven, hath he given unto thine hand, and hath made thee ruler over them all. Thou art what? So how do we know the head of gold represents Babylon? Because the Bible says so. The Bible interprets itself. Important. Don't ever forget that. You are this head of gold, he says. You are the head of gold. Now, Babylon was that beautiful city. One of the marvels of the world with its hanging gardens and everything. A marvelous place. This is one of the tablets of Nebuchadnezzar. The archaeologists have found some of the writings of Nebuchadnezzar over there. And this is from one of his tablets. Babylon, the city which is the delight of my eyes, which I have glorified, may it last forever. He did glorify it. The one of the wonders of the world, but it was not going to last forever. Here's one of the letters of Nebuchadnezzar the archaeologist found. He says that the whole earth is prostrate at her feet. When we look at chapter 4, we see where Nebuchadnezzar is glory in all of this stuff when God makes him insane. He says again in the tablets, may it last forever. It didn't. It only lasted from 605 to 539. And it fell. Watch this. Verse 39. And after thee shall arise another kingdom inferior to thee, and another third kingdom of brass, which shall bear rule over all the earth. And the fourth kingdom shall be as strong as iron, for as much as iron breaks in pieces and subdues all things, and as iron that breaks all these, shall it break in pieces and bruise. You see what's taking place here. He says, after you is going to come another kingdom. But what kind of a kingdom? It says, an inferior kingdom there. Did you see that? Another kingdom inferior to thee. What we're going to see in this prophecy is Jesus pulls back the veil and lets us now look from the time of Daniel to the very time in which we are living. After thee shall arise another kingdom inferior to thee. You know, it's bad enough when you get beat by somebody better than you. But what a humiliation to be beat by somebody inferior to you. I'm sure this did not set well with Nebuchadnezzar at all. He was that golden head. He was going to stay there. But no, God says after you is going to come this other kingdom. So in chapter 5 of Daniel, we find a very interesting thing taking place. 
Nebuchadnezzar is now dead. His grandson Belshazzar is ruling in Babylon, and he throws a drunken feast there. So let's go to the fifth chapter of Daniel for a moment, and then we'll come back to Daniel 2. Daniel chapter 5 and verse 25. They're in that banquet hall. A hand comes and starts writing on the wall. Verse 25 says, this is the writing that was written. Mini, mini, tico, eupharsin. And this is the interpretation of the thing. Mini, God has numbered thy kingdom and finished it. Tico, thou art weighed in the balances and found wanting. Perez, thy kingdom is divided and given to who? So when Babylon fell, what did the arms and chest of silver represent? How do we know? The Bible says so, okay? This is important. You know, Babylon was the greatest and most spectacular of the kingdoms, but now comes silver, just as silver is inferior to gold. And here you have two arms that join in the chest, the Medes and the Persians making up the Medo-Persian Empire. As the Babylonians use gold extensively in their culture, the Medes and the Persians use silver. They had a palace in Shushan that all of the shingles on the palace were made of silver. I would like to have that roof. <laughs> and if they ever re-roof, I'd like to take their throwaways. <laughs> you see, they use this silver. Also, as each of these metals are becoming less in value, they're still becoming stronger more powerful in that sense. So in that Belshazzar's feast, when all of a sudden this bloodless hand began to write in fiery letters on the wall, meeny, meeny, tico, you farson, they called for Daniel to tell him what it meant. And Daniel told him, God has numbered your kingdom and finished it. You are weighed in the balances and found wanting, and your kingdom is divided and given to the Medes and to the Persians. The Medes and the Persians were going to rule for a while. This is an interesting thing with the Medes and the Persians. When we look in Isaiah, written about 150 years before Cyrus and Darius, the Mede and the Persian, God says that to the Lord, to his anointed, to Cyrus, whoso, whose right hand I have holden, to subdue nations before him, and I will loose the loins of kings to open before him the two leave gates, and the gates shall not be shut. It says that his loins would be loose. When you read chapter 5 of Daniel, it says when Daniel, or when Belshazzar got that message from Daniel, it says that his loins were loosed and his knees smote one against the other. You see, when the fear of God comes upon somebody, you get this... Some of you may have been scared by things in the past that will put a real hurt in your tummy. It just cramps you up. You, your muscles are tight. You, you shiver. You shake. Well, that's what Belshazzar was doing there. But God had said this 150 years before his birth. Remember, Daniel, in Daniel chapter 5, was promoted to the third ruler in the kingdom of Babylon. That night the kingdom fell... And they didn't kill all of the rulers. They killed all of them except for Daniel. And Daniel was put in the third place in the other kingdom. Because he trusted God. He believed in God. And was going to do what God said even if it meant dying for it. So we find that what the Medes and the Persians did, the Babylonians thought they were so secure that they were having that drunken party as the Medes and the Persians were all around the city. They didn't just sneak up that night. They'd been under siege for weeks and weeks, but they were self-secure. The walls were impenetrable. Nobody could get through or over those walls. The water, the Euphrates River, 